Okay, this. Um, so I'm Catherine Tunna, and I'll say a bit more to introduce myself in just a moment. But uh, first, I'd like to say something about the International Society for Environmental Epidemiology, or ISCE. Uh, from what we can see from the registration, about half of you are ISCE members. For those of you that aren't, ISCE is the premier scientific association in environmental epidemiology that focuses on um, fostering epidemiological research on the effects of environmental exposures in humans. It aims to stimulate communication between health professionals, promote methodological advances, and strengthen environmental health policy. If you aren't a member of ISEE, I, I strongly recommend you look at the ISEE website where you can see um, some very nice messages from ISEE leadership about the, what the value is of being an ISEE member. And uh, for those of us who are in ISEE, I can say that it's really a, an essential part of our professional community network and uh, adds uh, a lot of value to the work that we do. So ISCE has uh, several committees. One of those committees is the Capacity Building and Education Committee, or CAPE. And the CAPE committee is uh, uh, organizing uh, the short course here. Uh, and CAPE aims to strengthen ISCE members' research capacities by providing educational opportunities, mentorship, capacity building, and networking. We also host the ISEE Global Education Channel, uh, which is on YouTube, and uh, you can find uh, a range of material related to environmental epidemiology on the YouTube channel. So for example, lectures from leading researchers, uh, some of the previous webinars that CAPE and other chapters of, or other um, groups within ISEE have organized, as well as keynotes and other um, uh, lectures from the previous annual conferences. So um, I should add that the uh, lectures for this short course are being recorded and we will put those on the YouTube channel after the course. So you'll be able to go back and, and visit those lectures uh, in the future. So the organizers of this short course are, are myself. I am the ISEE CAPE chair, Manolis Kogavinas, who is the former president of ISEE, Alistair Woodward, who has served as an ISEE counselor, and Ariada Moreno, who has um, helped, uh, uh, been an immense help in organizing the, the course and with the logistics. So I'll just introduce myself uh, a bit further. So um, I am a, an environmental epidemiologist and associate professor at IS Global. Uh, as I mentioned, I'm the chair of the CAPE committee and have been involved in CAPE for several years now, um, served as the secretary previous, uh, prior to being the chair. Uh, I did my, my training in uh, environmental health and, uh, it, through a master's at Columbia University and then went on to do my doctoral training in environmental health and epidemiology at Harvard University. And much of my work focuses on characterizing exposure to and the health effects of air pollution from outdoor and household sources. And uh, most of my work really sits at this intersection between epidemiology, e environmental exposure science, and health impact modeling. Related to COVID, I'm leading a project called COVAIR CAT, which is funded by the Health Effects Institute uh, and looks at the relationships between ambient air pollution and COVID related morbidity and mortality in a large general population study in Catalonia. And uh, I'm also uh, involved as a co-investigator in the Apollo C project, which is uh, looking at the influence of air pollution, uh, specifically household air pollution on uh, recovery following hospital admission to, for, from COVID in Uganda. So there are several ways in which environment might affect COVID-related outcomes. And um, that's obviously the focus of this short course. And uh, to think about what 
some of those relationships might be. I took inspiration from this publication from Joe Eisenberg from a few years ago, and you'll hear from him uh, on Thursday, uh, to help sort of organize uh, how, how thinking around some of these relationships between environmental factors and the various dimensions of the COVID pandemic. So this matrix sort of shows how environmental factors can contribute to uh, the um, initial emergence of uh, the, the novel SARS-CoV-2 virus, as well as its transmission by influencing factors such as population size, host characteristics, and modes of transmission, as well as the COVID-19 health burden, so specifically morbidity, mortality, and COVID-19 inequalities. And in terms of environmental factors, we have grouped them in this, uh, in this matrix according to the more sort of distal environmental contributors uh, that are part of global environmental change, such as land use change, <clears throat> global pollution, and food systems. But there are also more proximal environmental factors, um, such as air pollution, uh, meteorology and the built environment that can contribute to these uh, various dimensions of the pandemic. So this matrix you'll see is sort of reflected in the organization of the short course. Um, so today we really start the course off by focusing on the, the basics of COVID-19 to get everyone on the same page in terms of uh, how COVID outcomes are defined, uh, as well as the basic epidemiology of, of <clears throat> COVID and how it's modeled. We'll then go on to look at how global environmental change has contributed to uh, the, is, is relevant for the emergence of uh, the SARS-CoV-2 pathogen and its dispersion, as well as the role of host susceptibility. So in this program here, you'll see that uh, for each day, there's a sort of common structure. We have four lectures, which are followed by a learning activity at the end of the day. Um, we'll, I'll explain more about how the learning activity is, is organized. Um, <clears throat> But the idea is that you would complete the learning activity at the end of at the end of each day. Uh, I've highlighted a few names here in red, and that's to give a, a shout out to our active uh, members of the CAPE committee who are lecturing on the short course. So in the following week, we will turn our attention to the influence of proximal environmental factors on COVID outcomes, and then look at how the COVID-19 response and recovery has important environmental health implications that need to be considered. So um, we will be using Zoom for the lectures. So each day we will meet here on Zoom. You will use the same link to enter into the Zoom sessions. Um, in terms of housekeeping, please keep your microphones muted and use the chat function to ask questions to the speakers. Um, depending on which link you used to get into Zoom, you might be showing up with your own name or with one of the names of the organizers. If you are um, showing up with a name other than your own, please uh, go in to um, edit your name so we can, we can see who you are. Otherwise, we have uh, many clones of the organizers out there. And just to note, the sessions will be recorded. So in addition to Zoom, we'll be using two other platforms over the uh, short course. So we're going to be using Slack. Uh, and the, the Slack is really designed to give you an opportunity to discuss amongst yourselves and to ask questions to the lecturers outside of the specific Q&A session following their lecture. Um, in some cases, this, this will uh, allow you to uh, have a more asynchronous discussion that can carry on over the, over the two weeks of the short course. We'll close the Slack at the end of the, of the two weeks. But for each of the uh, lectures, you'll see in the Slack a specific channel. So um, you can present your discussion uh, topic or question in, in that uh, specific channel. And uh, the final platform that we'll be using is Moodle. 
And uh, we're using M Moodle uh, really for the learning activities. So at the end of each day, uh, we'll ask you to go from Zoom to Moodle and uh, you'll find the learning activity there organized in uh, the, the days of the, of the short course. So days one through four. And um, the idea is that you complete the learning activities straight, straight away after the lectures. Uh, we will keep the learning activities open for 24 hours, um, but uh, please do uh, get to them in those 24 hours or, or, or you'll find that they're closed. And there are also some uh, suggesting reading materials available for each day on, on the Moodle. So I know it's, uh, it's, it's three platforms, it's a bit, uh, it's a bit, uh, much to, to manage, but it gives us a lot of flexibility to, uh, to present the lectures, but also have this more uh, dynamic opportunity for discussion through, through Slack and uh, conduct the learning activities. So if you've completed the lectures and the learning activities, you will receive a certificate of participation at the end of the short course from ISEE. And uh, I would like to just give you an overview of who, who the participants are. Um, this is a few days old, so I think we have more participants than this now, but um, overall there's, let's say about 130 participants, a little bit under 50% are ISCE members, and uh, most participants are researchers. And we have very nice geographic distribution among the participants. You can see there's a lot of representation from the US, from Spain, also Ghana, uh, but you know, quite diverse in terms of global regions that, uh, that are represented here, which is great to see. So I will um, pass over to Manolis Kogovinas to say a bit more about the motivation of the course. And um, before we do that, there'll be a short poll just to get a better idea of the participants, your backgrounds and interests. And uh, we'll have a Q&A after Manolis's presentation. So if there are any questions about the course organization or uh, the specific platforms, uh, you can, we, we can cover that in the Q&A. So uh, Ariadna, on to the poll. I will go ahead and stop sharing my screen. Okay. And will we see the results uh, yeah, so here? <laughs> now 70% of the participants have answered. So I'm waiting a little bit that everyone has finished and then we will share the, the results. Fantastic. Uh, perhaps I was speaking a bit quickly. I'm sorry for that. Uh, I do see in the chat there's a request for the speakers to um, speak a little bit more slowly. So we will we will try and do that. Okay, I'm closing the survey now. And you can see now the results. Okay. 
Should I start, Catherine? Yes. Sure. Yes, go ahead. Okay. So, and you can see my screen. So um, I'll follow up from Catherine. Hi, everybody. On uh, Catherine mentioned why we are doing a course on COVID-19. And this very first talk is introductory on um, COVID-19 and environment, infections and environment. Um, I'm working with Catherine at IS Global. Um, I originally graduated in Athens in Greece and did my training in epidemiology in London. And then I worked at the International Agency for Research on Cancer. And then it's about more than 20 years that I moved to Barcelona, kept my connections in Greece, and uh, mostly f uh, working on environment occupation and genetic factors in relation to non-communicable diseases. But I have done some of um, some had done some work on infections, and as many of us in this course, uh, given this enormous crisis that we have been living since a year now, we have moved into research also into COVID, and I'm coordinating um, a big population cohort study in Catalonia. And some years ago, I was the president of the ISE. Um, this is uh, IS Global. Epidemiology is uh, here in the first floor. Most of the center are labs, and uh, that's in the center of Barcelona. And that's me preparing the course. Uh, no, it's a joke. You, you don't prepare the course in the, I would like to prepare the course there lying down, but I didn't do that. Um, so uh, pandemics, we always had. Um, the first big registered pandemic is the Antonine pandemic, um, Roman Empire, starting in the Middle East. And we had um, uh, quite a few deaths, actually. Possibly it was smallpox or measles, we don't know. And then we had the Justinian pandemic at uh, Constantinople from the Byzant at the Byzantine Empire, again with uh, uh, many millions of deaths. And then we entered into the series of plagues. Um, that were uh, occurred in different years and um, um, this uh, had a tremendous toll uh, um, for the population. So you would have you know 50 percent of, of some of the regions losing their population. In recent years, the most well known and the most important was the Spanish flu about a hundred years ago. It's it's called Spanish flu, but it didn't originate in Spain. It originated somewhere in France, Germany, and um, but it was the uh, First World War, and so for for various reasons it was called the Spanish flu. With uh, we don't know exactly how many people died, between ten and a hundred million, perhaps fifty million, and then in recent years we have obviously HIV, and then a number of smaller pandemics um, or epidemics, and then we had. COVID that in a way was an announced pandemic. We didn't know that it would be COVID. We didn't know when it would happen, which virus would cause it, but we knew it would happen. And now we are um, uh, with um, uh, 3 million uh, deaths at this point in time. So um, let's talk with this very elaborate um, slides now about the relation between infections, non-communicable diseases, and the environment. We have the global environment and the local environment, and obviously the global environment affects the local environment. We have all the, for example, extreme events that um, are due to the climate change but affect local communities. And obviously uh, we have the other way around, local environment defining the global environment. Um, both type of environments affects infections and NCDs. Um, infections affect NCDs. We knew that beforehand, um, Epstein-Barr uh, with a number of lymphomas or uh, papillomavirus and cervical cancer or COVID now with a long COVID. Um, and NCDs affect infections. And again, an obvious recent example is uh, obesity affecting COVID. And there are also interactions that uh, uh, the environment, exposure to some chemicals affecting susceptibility to infections or NCDs. 
And these are areas that in environmental epidemiology, we have not evaluated very much. Um, infections in environmental epidemiology had been marginal. And now with COVID, they really came very strong and they will be a, a, an important area of research. So if we go back to the scheme, um, global environment, COVID-19, obviously, or climate change and cholera epidemics, local environment, the indoor environments with respiratory health or with COVID, air pollution with all sorts of diseases, green spaces with all sorts of health outcomes, obesity and others, infectious diseases causing NCDs, lots of examples, and COVID producing long COVID, uh, long-term effects, um, NCDs and health-related conditions affecting susceptibility to infections, the best example is COVID precisely, or infections and the environment interaction and increasing susceptibility. And I'll give an example of PFAS, so one of the very common chemicals we have and vaccine response. Um, this is a photo of deforestation. And uh, so what has this to do with COVID? I mean, for one thing, this, this photo is from Brazil. So the common aspect is Bolsonaro, but you know, I'm talking more generally, not about only the situation in, in Brazil. Um, so what is the connection between climate change, loss of biodiversity and habitat, human infringements on nature and COVID? So COVID is an infectious disease. And at the same time, uh, one can say it's also an environmental disease because its origin to a large extent comes from the, this big uh, global changes we have. Um, if we have a wider view on the, um, the new diseases we have, the new infectious diseases, Ebola, Zika, the Nipah encephalitis, and some of the pandemics, um, many of them, most of them are zoonotic. They have come up from uh, animals to humans. This has have always happened. We all always had transmission from animals to humans, but then um, it stopped there. Humans did not transmit it to other humans or it was local. And again, it stopped there. We have, um, um, and these are estimations, about um, 1.7 million undetected viruses in mammals and birds. And of them, again, a rough estimation, many hundreds of thousands could potentially infect humans. So the potential for a, an epidemic is there. And we have some important reservoirs of pathogens, um, bats, rodents, humans, birds. So we have a situation that was always there. We had the zoonotic reservoir, diversity of microbes in nature in an area. What has changed in recent years, and that's why we are saying this is an announced epidemic, is that we have interfered a lot with the environment. The, the environment changes, temperature changes, areas, for example, that were not uh, um, optimal for the multiplication, say, of the mosquito now becomes. So we have new areas that are become endemic for malaria. And there are millions or many examples. Let me take another example, very, very simple, light. Light pollution, you know, who would think that light pollution would be important? Well, light, because we have uh, more areas with light, which is good, brings also um, insects. And if there are insects, this is food for bats, which means bats come closer to human communities. So there are lots of ways that all these changes we have had this last 50, 100 years have affected the environment and have helped to produce more epidemics. And obviously what is a major factor is the uh, frequency of human and pet contact with natural reservoirs. In uh, Southeast Asia, we have about 30% of the natural forests that have been destroyed. We have been, and in many other places, but Southeast Asia is among the uh, places where we have more deforestation. So we are coming in contact with reservoirs that before we were not in contact which means new possibilities for transmission. You put us together with international mobility. You can go from Wuhan to Milan in Italy in a few hours. You don't have to wait 20 years. And you have also the problem that we have uh, of degradation of the public health structures, and then you have an a pandemic. So that's why we are saying that the cause of the pandemic is an infectious disease, but the causes are wider. And that's why we are evaluating also from the environmental aspect, the causes and the solutions for the pandemic. 
Another obvious connection with the environment are the internal spaces. And we have learned how important they are. Initially, all the discussion was on the droplets. And then we, um, a number of people were saying it is the aerosols, the internal environment that is uh, more important. And there are lots of these schemes like the one you see here. You know, how you transmit if you're silent, two minutes, 15 minutes, and an hour. If you talk, you emit many more respiratory particles, as you can see. And if you shout or sing in a closed environment, you increase much more um, the emission of respiratory particles. So if you are infected, you would infect everybody else. The other connection that we have, there are many connections between environment, COVID, um, and diseases. Um, we see from this slide, this is, um, we are now submitting this week. It's from the cohort study that I mentioned before from Catalonia that Catherine also is working. And it's long-term effects. How did the response to the COVID affect long-term, the lockdown? And in this, uh, in this study where we have uh, about 10,000 people, we have looked at various factors and mental health outcome, severe depression, severe anxiety. And this is a major outcome. And I'm putting just some factors. We have looked very carefully on um, household conditions, interpersonal conflicts obviously very important, uh, increased risk for severe depression and severe anxiety for families that have strong conflicts and have no solution because that was the lockdown. Financial strain, huge problem because of the economic crisis that comes with COVID, again, affecting uh, people with depression and anxiety. But I'm, I'm gonna comment on the wider environment. These are um, effects of the lockdown and, but we have a number of other effects. So uh, proximity or access to outdoor spaces, important. And it's nearly obvious. You have a family living in a small flat with no access to outdoor spaces. You have outdoor spaces. This obviously is important to prevent um, um, well-being, to, to promote well-being. Noise, why is noise important? Well, because we are all day in house. So before you were many hours outside and you didn't even hear, now everybody's inside, so it becomes much more important. So a number of wider environmental issues may have, that we didn't suspect before, may have an increased effect uh, on a number of outcomes like mental health, not necessarily infection. And here is one of the other examples that I mentioned before. Um, which is an area that we have not worked well in environmental epidemiology, but we have to. The COVID tells us that we have to look much more carefully on the interactions between chemical in and infections. So this is a very nice study by Philippe Granchon on um, PFAS and uh, response to vaccine, vaccine levels. And so they had um, um, an analysis of uh, the maternal levels and also of the children's levels in different ages and the responses to tetanus and diphtheria. And you can see that uh, uh, people who have exposure, the higher levels of exposure to these chemicals that are really very common in the environment, you know, are related to a lower capacity to um, develop um, sufficient antibody levels. It is, the antibody levels are sufficient, but you know, a lower actually levels of um, um, antibodies in the children that have exposure to PFAS, which is uh, very interesting, but we have very few of these studies. So um, environmental epidemiology, uh, just to give a wider um, view, um, has made huge contribution for preventing disease and promoting health. We started many years ago with looking at extreme events and then we moved to widespread population exposures. So we did, that's one, some of the studies that really defined environmental epi. December 1952, London fog, you know, you couldn't see in 20 meters distance or Minamata and mercury in Japan where the mothers were exposed, nothing big happened to them, but then their kids got exposed and they did this tremendous syndromes. And here you see this very, very famous photo by Smith. And following these evaluation of extreme events, we obviously still have a lots of extreme events. We moved to uh, 
lower level exposures that are widespread. And I'm putting this slide, this historical study, um, this was published in 1992. And I'm putting this because it is actually the big first study that brings forward the issue of endocrine disruption. And they published this study. There's lots of methodological issues with this study, but it's important historically showing that there's a decrease on, on sperm quality and they postulated that this is due to environmental uh, chemicals that have an hormonal action. Um, we are interested on non-clinical disease. We know in environmental epidemiology, and this also applies to our studies on COVID, that one thing is clinical disease, but we are interested on what happens in the population as such. This is a little girl from studies we did in the south of Barcelona. Now she's an adolescent. And um, we're interested, and she's okay, but she has been exposed to POPs, to exalcorobenzene and PCBs, and maybe she has lost some of her capacity. This is not a clinical case, but we're interested in what happens in the population more generally. And we are interested on inequalities in health. And this is crucial also for COVID. Take indoor air pollution, extremely important factor for health. If we talk, we look globally, indoor air pollution is um, distributed in a very unequal way, obviously affecting low income uh, countries much more. So we're interested on local and global inequalities. So environmental epidemiology, we started with extreme events, we went to widespread exposures, and now we have new challenges and new opportunities. We have the whole issue of global climate change. We have the huge issue of cities. They are growing enormously. The expectation, for example, for 2100 is Lagos will have 80 million people. Um, so how do you manage this? And widespread pollution, which is a huge issue. And now we have also, we found out that we have a huge issue with the infectious diseases in relation also to the environment, the COVID-19 pandemic. On the same time, we are developing new methods and tools, sensors, satellites, uh, data science capacity, and we managed to address complexity. And this is extremely important if we deal with COVID. You can say COVID is just SARS-CoV-2 COVID, and it's not like that. And during the course, we'll talk about all this, as they call it, syndemic. We have the uh, SARS-CoV-2 affecting COVID, but then you have other factors, NCDs, you have health-related practices, you have social and community networks, you have social determinants and wider political aspects. And this is the same scheme as what uh, uh, Catherine showed by Joe Eisenberg put in another way, so I'll skip it. So in front of this global crisis, what would be your attitude? You can fight against the world if you want, this is by son -Pay. I mean, that's what anti-vaxxers are doing. Uh, not good. You can resign. The picture is pretty bleak, gentlemen. The world climates are changing, the mammals are taking over, and we all have a brain about the size of a walnut. So you can resign, that's not good. You can become a cynic, that's from uh, the previous one with, with Larson, and this is from El Roto, Spanish. This is you become, become a cynic, just care about yourself. We sell bombs and then welcome the orphans. Fair trade, says this businessman. Or you can do the ISE course. I'm joking. But basically, um, what we want to do is to respond to this global crisis using our strengths, which is knowledge and public health action. And that's what we want to achieve with the course. And I'll stop here. Fantastic. Thanks so much, Manolis. Um, I'm looking at the chat and I see a lot of questions about how to get into Moodle. Um, you, Ariana, do you want to comment on what people should be doing to find their link to Moodle? Yes. Um, so maybe you can um, search it for the subject education and training IS Global new user account. So instead of Moodle, uh, you can write this and you can try to find the email. Um, if you cannot find me, please write it to me because I'm trying to fix it, fix it right now. Um, so just let me know if you can find this, this email. Thank you. 
And um, for those of you uh, who who missed it, please do uh, make sure that your name is showing up in your is in your user. If you came in through another link, you will show up with one of the organizers' names. Um, but we'd we'd like to see who you are as well. Are there any other questions? We have just a few minutes before we move on to the next talk from Neil Pierce. Uh, but we we can take some more questions about either the course logistics uh, organization or the content. There is one question, we knew it would happen. Can you elaborate in which perspective we knew that? Um, we knew it would happen because we have many more zoonotic diseases happening. 70% of the new diseases are zoonotic and this is because of the uh, wider destruction of the reasons I mentioned, the contact with nature, with uh, natural habitats um, and with higher mobility, obviously. Uh, so we knew it would happen again. We cannot predict when it will happen or what exactly will be the, vi the virus. But uh, knowing that it will happen, you can take measures. What happened in our societies is not acceptable because we entered into this epidemic and we didn't even have uh, masks or, or uh, you know, uh, other ways or gloves. You know, several of you, you know, I was in a hospital. Several of you must have been in uh, health services or hospitals. And, and, you know, we saw the, the disaster of the first two months. So this is not acceptable in our societies because we knew it will happen. We don't know when, but it will happen and it will happen again. Uh, 70%, there's a question when we are saying 70% of new diseases, do we mean all diseases or infectious diseases? It's all diseases, basically. I mean, the new diseases are infectious diseases, basically. So it is uh, nearly the same. Um, so we do have new diseases in the last 50 years, and most of them are infectious, and most of them are zoonotic. There's a question about whether the classes will be recorded. We will, we are recording them and we will make them available uh, as quickly as we can on the YouTube channel. Um, I will we'll aim to do that within the 24 hours uh, so that you can still do the learning activity, but um, let's, we're gonna have to test that out uh, today. So unless there are any other burning questions, I would suggest we move on to Neil. Um... Hi. Uh, the floor is yours, Neil. Yeah, thanks. So I'll just um, get my slide. So I don't have a um, slide that talks about myself, but um, Basically, I'm from New Zealand. I'm an um, epidemiologist and statistician, and I'm now at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, and I, I mainly work in epidemiological methods, um, study design and data analysis, mostly for non-communicable disease, um, but I've got involved in some work on, on COVID in the last year, like, uh, like most people. So um, I'm going to talk about measuring disease and then about avoiding bias. So I'll start with measuring disease and I'll talk about three things, um, counts versus rates, selection and misclassification and what do we need to do in terms of getting better data on, on COVID. So counts versus rates. Um, the, this is a paper that we did in um, the American Journal of Public Health. Um, we wrote it back in about March, it got published in about June. On, on accurate statistics on COVID-19 are essential for policy guidance and decisions. 
And then later on, um, a few of us did a paper in the International Journal of Epidemiology saying that comparisons between countries are essential for the control of COVID-19. And I think that's still true, but it was very true in the early years of uh, early months of the epidemic because we, we had no very little, um, we had no, almost no randomized trials. We had very few formal studies, had lots of modeling for which was all hypothetical. But we had examples of countries that had been very successful and countries that had not. I, I live in the UK, but I'm from New Zealand and New Zealand, Australia, and many of the Asia Pacific countries like um, China, Taiwan, Vietnam, um, Singapore have done really well in controlling COVID and North America and Europe have, has, have both done very, very badly. And there's a couple of reasons for that, which I might mention later on, but I, I think Certainly in the UK where I am, the biggest problem is that people have not been willing to learn from what other countries were doing. Um, there's a certain sort of arrogance involved in thinking that we know best and we can't learn from the rest of the world. But this actual article firstly arose out of the fact that um, in the early days of the epidemic, um, most of the graphs that were in the newspapers were just on the number of cases. And, and um, and that's quite useful for um, um, when an epidemic gets started, because it gives you a very good idea of the doubling time, because an epidemic might start just in, in one city or one region of a country. Um, but there's big problems comparing countries. So for example, you can see here, um, in fact, out of all these countries, the country that had the, the biggest rates was Belgium. Um, but Belgium is a small population. So in terms of actual number of cases, it did not, um, did not look very important. And other countries like Italy looked more important, but Belgium has, has always been one of the highest. Um, I, I won't talk much about interpreting these graphs apart from that, but I would note that I downloaded this graph on the 12th of March, 2020. It was my last day in the office. And, um, and I downloaded this graph and I, and I thought in the UK, we're in big trouble. And you can see that most of these countries, even just with number of cases, you can see that most of these countries are on the same trajectory. And if you look, Italy was at day 16 since, since they start counting when a country has a hundred cases. Um, UK was in day five, so it was only, um, it was day five versus day 17, so it was only 11 days behind, um, and it was doubling every three days. But I downloaded this because on the same day, um, the UK government said, um, uh, we are four to six weeks behind Italy, and um, it's doubling every um, seven to 10 days, so nothing is urgent, we don't need to lock down. And, and, but anyone could look at this graph and say, see we're less than two weeks behind Italy and we do need to lock down very quickly. Um, the reason they didn't is that the government was advised by UK scientists who had very sophisticated models and their very sophisticated models said that we were four to six weeks behind Italy. Whereas anyone can look at this graph and see we're only 11 days behind. And in fact, it was 12 days later that we got up to the same level as Italy and, and it was 11 to 12 days later that the government finally um, locked things down. And an extra 20 or 30,000 people died because of that delay. So don't believe in complicated models um, unless you've really checked them out. You can learn a lot from these simple, simple graphs. But um, just in terms of um, case numbers, small countries like the Netherlands and Belgium looked like they were doing very well and were behind countries such as Italy and the UK, but they actually had very high death rates when you take the small population into account. So counts are useful when an epidemic is getting started and you can continue to make useful comparisons within a country, like how fast is, are the numbers doubling. But once an epidemic is established, you, you need to use rates for international comparisons, which is mostly what is being done now. Secondly, selection and misclassification. So here's a population, which we'll call P. And then some of the people in the population are currently infected with COVID, uh, with SARS-CoV-2. So that's this box. 
out of the out of the total population, a certain group of people have symptoms, and some of them have symptoms because they have COVID. Um, but but these are more or less the same symptoms as the flu or some other infectious diseases. So there will be many people who have symptoms who do not have COVID. Um, and, uh, and there will be many, about half the people with COVID have no symptoms. And then some of these people get tested. So this is this box. Um, so the blue are the people who tested positive. This group here are the true positives. They've got COVID and they tested positives. These are the false negatives. They're the people who've got COVID, but they tested negative. These are the false positives. So they, the, the test came out positive, but it's just um, a chance finding. And this, these are the true negatives. So you can see that these boxes are getting, getting quite complicated. And finally, um, some people die. And um, some of them will have also tested positive. Some of them will not, will have tested negative. Um, some of them will have um, been a false positive. And um, you can see just with these very simple boxes that the, the numbers get very complicated because of the problem, particularly in the early months of the pandemic of identifying um, cases. So we have a number of different figures here. We have those who died after having tested positive, which is a subgroup of everyone who died. We have the so-called cases, those who tested positive. We have those with symptoms, um, many of whom will not have even been tested. And we have the number which is actually infected, which is uh, the red here. And we have the total population. And th the only thing we know with reasonable certainty is the total population. All these other numbers are estimates and often they are, they are very bad estimates. So P is the only variable that we know more or less correctly. But the key thing we don't know is the total number infected. And if you go back here, that's this box. Everyone who's been infected, we don't know that. Um, we still don't know that for most populations, but early on, we certainly didn't know. Um, so that's once again, that's the number infected. That's people with symptoms. That's people who have been tested. Um, some positive, some negative, and these are people who have died. Now, why does all this matter? Because, um, uh, or, or, well, I'll come to that in a moment. Also, um, tests for past infection typically have much worse sensitivity and specificity. Um, and a problem with most of the tests that are on the market, and this was true early on, but it's still true, is that typically what they do is get a new test and they get a, get a group of people who clearly have COVID, like people who have been hospitalized. And then they get people who are clearly healthy and don't have COVID and they, they test them at both groups. And you always find a good separation between the groups. But if you use these tests in the general population where many people have mild disease or they don't have symptoms, um, these tests don't work so well. So it's been a problem all along that the tests look very good in trials, but they don't work so well out in the community uh, when we use them out in the field. So um, these are the statistics we'd like to know. We'd like to know the attack rate, which is the total number of cases per population. So that's sort of what gets reported now in terms of how many cases per 100,000 people per day. But that's the incidence, that's the new cases divided by the total population. And the incidence is what's very hard to, to estimate. Then we have the case fatality rate, which is the test positive deaths divided by the total number of people who have test positive. We have the infection fatality rate, which is the test positive deaths divided by the total number of people infected. And then we have the population fatality rate, which is just COVID deaths per total population. And, and all of these statistics are important, but the key thing that's important and was missing early on and is still, still not known for most countries is the infection fatality rate, because we don't know 
how many people in total or what proportion of the population have been infected. Um, and this is important. Um, here's an example early on in, in the pandemic in the first couple of months, London where I live, um, about one in every thousand people died in the first month or two of the pandemic and it was the same in New York. So um, the, the minimum that the um, infection fatality rate could be would be 0.1% because if everyone got infected and 0.1% had died, then the, that would be the infection fatality rate, 0.1%. Um, but the problem is we didn't know what the, how many people had been infected. Was it 100% um, of the population? Was it 3%? Was it 10%? And you get a completely different answer for the infection fatality rate, depending on what you think the total number infected is. And to take one example, um, if 0.1% of the population has died and 3% of the population has been infected, then 0.1 divided by 3%, so that's 0.1 um, divided by 3, um, and you multiply that by 100, and you get an infection fatality rate of 3.3%. On the other one hand, if you know that 0.1% has died and everyone has been infected, the infection fatality rate is 0.1%. And these numbers were crucial in all the arguments that were going on and are still going on about the pandemic. Some people, I, I think they're completely wrong, but some people say it's just like flu, the, the death rate is less than 0.1%, so just let it spread. Um, and we've seen in Brazil what happens other people come up with very high estimates. I think the right estimate is about 1%. So at this time, about 10% of Londoners had been infected and 0.1% um, of all Londoners had died. So 0.1 over 10 multiplied by 100 gives you an infection fatality rate of about 1%, which means it's between 10 and 25 times as fatal as flu. And, and so you can't treat it like flu, you can't use herd immunity, you're just going to kill hundreds of thousands of people. Um, you, you have to take the, the Asian approach and um, essentially control and eliminate the disease, which is something we're still not doing within Europe. Um, so that's the problem. And the problem early on, and the problem still now in many countries, is that we don't know how many people have been infected. And you can't tell that by looking at testing because only some people get tested. You can't tell that by looking at the number of cases reported because um, once again, most people don't get tested and most people, half, half the cases don't have any symptoms. So they're not gonna get tested um, routinely. So what do we need to do in terms of statistics? Um, they, um, the problem is that we don't have the basic information needed to build reliable forecasts. Um, doesn't mean we shouldn't make decisions, but we could make better decisions or at least understand the options better if we had better data. And the key thing we don't know is the proportion in the population that has been infected. Um, key problems with current statistics. Once again, this was early on, but it's still true now. Uh, for some of this is still true now. Many published graphs just use the number of deaths in each country. Most testing is done in people with symptoms, so it does not estimate the true population attack rate. Um, most population surveys uh, are not done randomly um, and, and the tests themselves have not been, mostly not been validated in the field. So what we need to do is firstly use rates rather than counts, which most people are doing now. But the main thing every country in the world should be carrying out general population surveys, choosing people at random and testing them whether they have symptoms or they don't have symptoms. So we need repeated representative sampling of, of the general population. Um, more generally, uh, I think this is true for infectious disease uh, and non-communicable disease. A lot of people think that things like um, global burden of disease will um, means we don't have to do population surveillance anymore. 
that works for things like that we have good statistics for like mortality but if you have a new disease coming along like COVID or if you have diseases that are non-fatal like asthma which is an area I've done a lot of work in you can't rely on official statistics and you can't rely on global burden of disease you have to do routine surveys and th th these need to be done in every country in the world every few years and you need to have the whole survey system set up so that if something like COVID comes along, you can start doing surveys quickly. So that's about um, um, problems with estimating COVID. And I'll give one example of one approach to avoiding bias. And this is a study we published, uh, a paper we published in um, epidemiology on the test negative design which has in the past mainly been used to look at vaccine um, effectiveness, but can also be used for diseases such as COVID. So if you go back to this figure, suppose you do a case control study and, and not everyone is being tested, you have no general population surveys. Then the problem is if you get the cases, they're the people in the blue box who are the people who have been tested. And almost all of them will have been tested because they had some symptoms. And then if you choose a general population control group, um, it's just people chosen at random from the biggest box, then most of those have not got symptoms and they will also be different in other ways because um, we don't test people at random. We test people often because they're in an occupation where they need to be tested like healthcare workers or they're just people who are health seeking, uh, they, they like to be tested, they're nervous. So they will drive, they have a car, they, or they have access to public transport, they will drive and get tested and other people will not get tested. So if you compare people who test positive with controls drawn from the general population, you get a big bias um, because the test positive cases are a self-selected group they've got symptoms, they're motivated to get tested, they have the opportunity to get tested. So if we compare the test positives with a random sample with the general population, there will be selection bias. Um, and um, so controls would be a random sample of the general population, but the cases would be a non-random subgroup of all cases from the general population. They're just the ones who happen to get tested for some reason or another. Um, so one solution to that is, is the test negative design. So we just look at those who got tested and we compare those who test positive, who are the cases, with those who test negative, who are the controls. And this design has mainly been used to date to study vaccine effectiveness, but it can be used for COVID-19. Both groups will either be in the same occupation or will both have symptoms. So they will have gone through a similar selection process and information can be obtained relatively easily and quickly for both cases and controls. And to give you one example of the bias, um, early on in the epidemic, <clears throat> the death rate in healthcare workers, in, in fact, once PPE became available, you know, early on there were about 900 deaths in healthcare workers in the UK, it was very serious. But once PPE became available, the death rate in healthcare workers is actually very low and being in an intensive care unit is one of the safest places to be because they have proper protection. But so the relative risk for death for a healthcare worker for COVID after the first month or two was maybe between one and 1 1.5 times. It was elevated, but not very much. But at the same time, people looked in UK Biobank and found that the the relative risk for testing positive for a healthcare worker compared to the rest of the UK biobank participants was about seven times. And that was entirely because they were being tested more often and other people were almost entirely and other people were not being tested. So this is the test negative design. We compare those who test positive with those who test negative. And the assumption is that any selection pressures like health seeking behavior and having a car will be approximately equal, equally strong for the test positives and test negatives. And like I said, it's been work, used before for studies of vaccine effectiveness, but it's, it, it can work very well for COVID. Um, one qualification 
is that the test negatives will probably have been tested because they have symptoms. So they've probably got some other respiratory infection. So if you have a factor that increases the risk of both COVID-19 and other respiratory infections, then you won't find a difference between the two groups. Um, whereas if a factor increases the risk of COVID-19, but not other respiratory infections, then you will find it is more common in the test positive group. So if you wanna look at the um, um, paper we've done, we do suggest adding some additional general population controls um, uh, who, and they don't have to be sampled at random from the general population. Um, our, our suggestion in the UK initially was that if someone comes to a testing centre and tests positive, the control could be the person who drove them to the testing centre. As long as they don't have COVID, it's, it's okay for a control. Um, so there's, there's a number of issues that are a little bit more complicated than what I've presented here. But the basic idea is that, um, is, is that um, the only way to get around the basic selection effect is, is to compare the, the COVID cases with other people who have been tested for COVID and test negative. And then in the paper, and here I have some additional slides on additional population controls. And um, you don't even need to test the controls. They can just be someone from the general population who at least um, doesn't have symptoms. Um, the match control could be the accompanying person, or they could be chosen from um, electronic health records, like general practitioner records. And um, it will work provided that we assume that the selection process is similar for the cases and the match controls. So um, the, we, we can then have two sets of comparisons. The first, we compare those who test positive with those who test negative, and that's the standard test negative design. And we can have additional population controls, and we can compare the those who test positive with the general population and those who test negative with the general population. Um, and that's already been done in UK Biobank. Um, in fact, they, they didn't do this comparison. They did this comparison and this comparison, and they concluded that the, um, um, the risk factors for testing positive for COVID were the same as the risk factors for testing negative for COVID and therefore these were probably false negatives. But I think a more likely explanation is just they, they had some other respiratory infection which, um, which had similar risk factors like overcrowding. So, so this is um, a complicated, can be a complicated design, but the very basic comparison between those who test positive and those who test negative can be done very easily. And this design's already being used or planned to be used in, in several different countries. They've done a fantastic study in India using it. I know people in um, Denmark and Norway who are thinking of using it. It can be done within a general population cohort like Biobank, um, or can be added on to existing testing. We're, we're trying to do it in the UK um, in two different ways. We're trying to get it added on to the population testing. And also there's um, an app called Zoe where people just, um, record their symptoms on their phone every day. And we're trying to get a short questionnaire added on, essentially to compare those who are symptomatic and those who are, who are not symptomatic. And, and we're slowly building up a set of modules um, like demographics, occupation, overcrowding, social distancing, and so on. So I think that's my last slide. Um, and I think what I've shown you is quite complicated, but I think it's also appropriate because there's big problems with the COVID-19 statistics all around the world. And you, you have to be very careful about interpreting them. And to give one example from the UK again, I'm on several official committees here and we try and review, um, um, you know, for example, which occupational groups have um, the highest risk for COVID. And for healthcare workers, you can get an answer anywhere between a relative risk of one and a relative risk of seven or something in between like about three depending on what data set you look at um, so and all of them have problems so what we're now doing is to say that if you want to look at a particular occupation like healthcare workers or bus drivers you have to triangulate across all the different data sources because none of them is correct 
but they're all wrong in different ways. So by making comparisons, for example, between mortality data, population testing, um, things like biobank, at least by comparing across all the data sets, you get an idea about how, how bad the problem is <laughs> and you can try and make sense of the data. But um, just to finish, I think um, we, we had many um, failures with COVID, particularly in Europe and North America. And they were failures of pandemic preparedness. Um, they were failures of testing. They were failures of not, um, not locking down properly and not quarantining. But the other failure was not doing proper population surveillance. And, and I think one of the things we need to learn from this pandemic is that we need to have regular systems of population surveillance set up doesn't mean we have to do a survey every year, but we need to have them established so that when something like COVID comes along, we can go out and do population surveys straight away so that we can get the information we need to try and decide what to do. Okay, thank you. I think we have 15 minutes for, um, for a question and answer. Neil, there is a question by Rehnum, what kind of the analysis you have performed to show in this box. That was the initial slide. Oh, um, but um, I think it was just arbitrary, I guess, more or less. The yeah, it, it, it's, it's the thing that you mean the initial boxes could be anything, could be a cohort study, could be a case. I, I, I'm assuming you're looking at a population at one point in time. So it's essentially a cross-sectional study, but it could be comparing cases and controls or cases with the whole population. Mm. Can you comment, more, uh, Neil, on how things are changing concerning uh, selection biases uh, now as compared to you know, many months ago when the testing was much more uh, limited and more selected to people with you know, quite strong symptoms? Now testing is much, uh, much more widespread. Does this affect the type of biases you were describing? Yeah, I think the situation is much better, um, but it is still not very good. <laughs> um, and obviously, it, it varies greatly between countries. I mainly know about the UK. But in the UK, most testing is still being done for people with symptoms. Um, and probably somewhere between one third and one half of all cases don't have symptoms. And also the cases that don't have symptoms, they will be infectious for nine or 10 days. Whereas a case that has symptoms, they will have maybe two days when they don't have symptoms and then they get sick and they get tested. And, and at least some of those will then quarantine. So if you do the arithmetic, most of the new cases are caused by asymptomatic transmission from people who don't know that they're sick and haven't been tested. Um, so there's big arguments in the UK about mass testing um, using lateral flow tests I think they're actually a good idea, but there's a lot of people who think they're not. Um, but that's the only way, the only way to get good data um, and actually to control the epidemic is to somehow pick up all of the cases and um, plus have proper quarantine and proper isolation and so on. And for that, you need some sort of system of random population testing. Um, which some countries have, um, but, um, but the UK, it's still mostly people who have symptoms that get tested, unless they're being tested for a particular job. For example, if I go into the university, I haven't been for a while, but I think if I go in now, you go and have a lateral flow test. And, um, and if everyone in a workplace, for example, gets tested, then that's, that's useful data. But in terms of general population, it's still mostly testing people with symptoms. Yeah, but but my feeling is, is because we're doing many more tests now. Yeah. Uh, actually, there's less. You know, you, you can find many more uh, um, test negatives. Yeah. No, I I think that's true. Yeah, uh, I think it's much better, um, but still not perfect. <laughs> so there are two questions on population surveillance. Yeah, I think the um, the the ONS. Well, it, it's going to be very specific to different to the country. Um, in the UK, unfortunately, GPs don't do testing. Um, 
the, 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 the way to get tested is to go to one of these central, a car park in the middle of nowhere. Um, and it's, it's done by private contractors and it's a disaster. Um, but um, a lot of other countries, uh, you can't go to your GP and ask for a COVID test. It, it may have changed recently, but up till now you couldn't do that. It was all done by private contractors. Um, so in terms of um, random population testing, there's big problems here. You're correct that the ONS, the Office, Office for National Statistics are doing a, um, a random population survey and I'm actually a participant in that. I got tested on Saturday for that. Um, and that, that's a good survey, I think. And there's one other survey that's similar. Um, the question about does any country using the occupations to design, define the distribution of tests or vaccines, very important question. It's something I'm involved a little bit in here in arguing about. Um, I know some countries, well, most countries uh, are testing healthcare workers and uh, care home workers, uh, sorry, vaccinating them first or in the first group. So most countries are doing that, but there's a big question is, should you then um, vaccinate people who are like teachers or um, bus drivers or supermarket workers ahead of other people the same age? And there's big arguments about it. I'll give you my opinion. Um, firstly, it depends if you're, if you're vaccinating to stop deaths or you're vaccinating to prevent infection. And of course, ultimately you want to do both, but it depends which order you do them in is quite important. Um, there's actually an argument for vaccinating young people first because they <laughs> cause most of the infections. Um, but the UK and most countries has said the priority is to vaccinate people to reduce the number of deaths. And it's actually been very effective. It's the only good thing they've done here. So they've done it by age and um, um, then health and social care workers and people with serious comorbidities. And they've just today announced they've, they've covered half the country, which is everyone over 50 and anyone under 50 with a serious comorbidity. But now there's a big argument about the teachers. Now, um, by far the strongest risk factor for death is age. The second strongest one is being male. Um, male, males are effectively five years older than the same, equivalent, a female of the same age in terms of their COVID risk. The other equal second is a comorbidity. Um, so if you've got something like diabetes, it's like being five years older in terms of your um, risk of death. But apart from that, the occupational risks are not very great, maybe 1.5 times. So for example, if you have a 30 year old female teacher they have about the same risk of death as a, as a female who's not a teacher who's 35, who's five years older, or um, the same risk of death as a male who's not a teacher who's the same age. Uh, so a 30, year, a 30 year old person who's working with the public has about the same risk as a male who's sitting at home and has no contact with the public. So are you really gonna vaccinate a 30 year old female teacher ahead of a 50, 50 year old male who probably has 10 times the risk of, of death. So I think most countries have decided not to vaccinate by occupation because actually it's, it doesn't make sense in terms of preventing deaths. And it also creates a big mess because everyone claims they're a teacher, you know, they're a yoga teacher or that they're, they're, I'm teaching epidemiology on this course. So should I get vaccinated first? If you do it by risk, you're going to do it by age, by um, comorbidity, and you would also do it by gender, but no one wants to do that. So, um, uh, sorry, that was a long answer. <laughs> um, the self-test, the sensitivity and specificity. Um, the, if you're doing a PCR test, um, the PCR test works fantastically well, provided you swab the, right, the back of the throat right. Um, if you, so the biggest problem with PCR, some of the early studies had maybe a sensitivity of only 80%. It wasn't a problem with the test. It's just that if people who were infected, only 80% of them would get a bit of virus on the swab and 20% would miss it. So it's mostly a capture problem. It's not a problem with the test. The lateral flow test, people are arguing furiously about that. And a lot of people say they only have sensitivity of 50% and so on. But Actually, if you're looking at people who are currently infectious, 
they have really high sensitivity. It's more like 99%. And the, and the specificity is over 99%. The PCR picks up a lot of extra cases. They pick up dead virus, which where the person was, has had the disease, they were infectious three days ago. They're no longer infectious, but there's still a bit of dead virus sitting around. Um, so the argument is that if you're testing, not just to find who's been infected, but who's actually infectious today, the, the lateral flow tests work very well. It's still a problem if you test 50 million people each day and, and the prevalence is very low, you're still going to get a lot of false positives, but, but you get the same with PCR. Cochrane published very recently a review on this, and they were saying that in the general population, not necessarily the people at the, at the peak of their infectious phase, uh, the best test would be 80% sensitivity. And, and very, very high specificity, obviously. Yeah. Um, but, you know, it depends, you know, it's a matter of days, you know, you can get it up or down. But yeah. there are many that are, in fact, not all of them were even 80%. There are a few that were not good quality because they have been tested in uh, people with very high viral load, actually. Yeah. Not in the general population. And actually, the lateral flow, the, the thing in its favor is that if you test everyone twice a week, if you miss them on the first test, you're going to pick them up on the second one. It, so you, you may have a problem of false positives, but the sensitivity is very good if you're just repeatedly testing people. Because that would be, if it says, if it's 80%, uh, it would be 0 0.8 plus 0 0.2 times 0 0.8, I guess. Yeah. yeah. Um, so but assuming that you're, you're going to assume the tests are independent, but it'll yep. be something close to that. Yeah. Yep. Um, which is better? Should we vaccinate to prevent death or should we vaccinate to prevent transmission? Um, there's an ethical argument, but also there's a practical argument in the sense that if we're assuming that six months from now, everyone will have been vaccinated, what's the order we can do it in so that at the end, everyone's got covered and we have the minimum number of deaths and the minimum number of cases of long COVID. Most people I know argue that you will get the best result by vaccinating to prevent death. Um, but it, there is an argument about it because initially in the UK, the va vaccination is the only thing they've done well, but it worked very quickly. The deaths just came down really fast, but the number of cases were still occurring because these were people in old people's homes who were who were at risk, but actually weren't infecting anyone else. Whereas young people were infecting each other, but not dying. So you can make a case to actually vaccinate the most inf infectious people first. Um, but most people I know who have done the arithmetic say you're better to focus on preventing deaths. And um, and of course, in the long run, you want everyone to be vaccinated. It's just what the priority are. How do we truly know how many infections there are in the population? Do sentinel populations have to be tested at frequent intervals to understand changes and relate to deaths? Are there currently such efforts? Well, I think that's sort of happening, certainly in the UK with things like the ONS survey, because they are now being linked to hospitalizations and, and deaths. Um, you just need large, large po random population surveys um, to, um, uh, that are linked up to hospitalizations and deaths. And that, that is being done. Um, but um, I, the, so I think in the UK, we know how many people have been infected. I couldn't tell you the number. It's something like 20% plus another 50% uh, have been vaccinated, though there's overlap between those two. Um, but um, yeah, not many countries have that sort of data. Okay, we have two more minutes. Uh, any last question? Um, what could be the frequency in populations considered? Would you like to say, Catherine, what could you clarify what you, you mean? It's not Catherine necessarily, it's somebody using the name of Catherine. Oh, okay. Um, if anyone wants to jump in, feel please feel free. Um, um, I'm not sure. Uh, I still think the best thing is random population surveys. And how often you do them is, is you could argue about. Um, time points for repeat sampling. If you're doing it for um, to actually pick up infections and prevent them, then twice a week at least. But if you're 
doing them like the ONS survey just to look at the population trends, then you know once a month or once every couple of weeks seems to be quite quite sufficient. Um, though they do seem to have more detailed data than that um, because they can um, they can uh, you know they can actually say you know things have changed this week. What about pool testing? Um, someone may know more about that than me, but it's a really nice idea. I actually proposed it here for testing professional rugby players. The, the, the idea, because the professional rugby players, they get tested every week and it costs a lot of money and they get some false positives. And the idea is you can pull samples like um, uh, combine four samples and um, just test them, just put, put the combined sample through the machine. And that saves a lot of money and actually cuts down on the false positives as well. If you get a positive result, then you have a second sample from the four people and you test them individually. And it's been approved by FDA and it does seem to work um, somewhere, but uh, in some places. But it's, it's not, being very not being as widely used as I thought. I think partly because lateral flow testing has sort of taken over because it's so much cheaper and easier. Okay, we are, I think um, we have a 10 minutes break. Catherine, the real Catherine, Tone. Okay. So Catherine, we have a 10 minutes break. Okay. That's and right. We... And we'll um, see you back here then um, at, uh, uh, well, in 10 minutes, in 10 minutes uh, yeah. depending on where you are. <laughs> and, uh, and Joachim will be, uh, Rock Love will be the next speaker. Thanks. Thank you very much, Neil. Thanks. Okay.
welcome back everyone. And um, I suggest we get started with the next presentation. Joachim, um, the floor is yours and I leave it to you to present, uh, to present yourself. Thank you, uh, Catherine. So um, I'm going to share my screen first of all, get it started. So um, <clears throat> I'm going to talk about um, SIR models, which have been um, very much used in, in, uh, in the pandemic to understand um, uh, patterns and also to um, make forecasts and scenarios to look at potential uh, impact. Impact. So, for example, vaccines, as was discussed just now. Um, this is a very big um, <laughs> research area, and um, it's a little bit challenging to, to actually describe, to present it like um, in, in just uh, 20 minutes or so. Um, we have plenty of time for questions, so I've, I've, uh, I'm hoping you there to ask questions and don't feel uh, stupid because it's also a very um, complicated uh, area. I'll do my best to explain it um, a little bit for you. Um, I'm a professor of epidemiology and public health at Umi University. Uh, I did my PhD in environmental epidemiology. Um, and basically since my PhD, I've been more and more going into uh, infectious disease modeling in relation to environment and climate change. Um, that's where, why I'm talking about the SIR models here today, I guess, um, been engaged in, in some COVID research lately as well. Um, but, but basically my research group and my lab in, in the university is looking into um, linking up um, process-based models with uh, epidem epidemiological data um, and, um, and and making a lot of uh, uh, scenarios and forecasts and so on. Um, also for 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 the COVID in in 2019, I was awarded a prize by the uh, Prince Albert of Monaco uh, on on global environmental change and infectious diseases. So, um, talking about infectious diseases and uh, infection dynamics, it's important to um, think about the system and, um, and, and it's an it's important um, reason why we have these SIR models um, is because we want to describe the system um, and the states that you move from being um, susceptible to infection, being exposed or infected, uh, becoming recovered, uh, maybe immune. Um, so and and for that uh, there is uh, a good modeling framework and good epidemiological frameworks for for um, studying these processes, uh, how you move from the different states, and um, it could be uh, very complex or it could be quite simple. Depends on um, your ambition level and and also depends on your um, disease and situation you want to study. Um, with these epidemiological models, there are key features um, which help us to understand epidemic trajectories. And I think all of you are probably quite well um, um, know about these, uh, some of these at least. Uh, for example, the R not value and herd immunity, and perhaps even the relationship between uh, R not values and herd immunity. Um, these are very important concepts uh, when it comes to understanding um, uh, the rate of, of spread, the rate of transmission, and the growth of epidemics, um, exponential uh, growth of epidemics. That, that's uh, really important uh, for um, controlling the epidemics, but also for epidemiological studies and, and um, um, knowing um, what's your counterfactual, for example. So um, these models are, uh, the SIR models are here to help us connect uh, pathogens, um, hosts, environment, uh, to understand um, how uh, epidemics evolve. Um, 
in the modeling framework, and uh, we have uh, um, uh, the S compartment, uh, which stands for susceptible individuals. They can get infected. Um, one could have um, uh, uh, birth into uh, the susceptible um, uh, compartment, depending on the time scale of the study. If it's uh, you know, if it's uh, something you study over years uh, and maybe even decades, uh, it's likely to, to be uh, new people coming into the population, either by migration or birth, um, which might not have the, the exposure of, of uh, the potentially endemic uh, uh, pathogen from before. So that's important to consider. You might have death rates as well out of these uh, compartments, which are not related really to to um, the disease that you study. It could just be background levels of, of uh, mortalities. Um, you move from being susceptible to, to becoming infected with a certain rate. Um, and, uh, and that rate is very important, of course. Um, and we want to slow that rate down uh, when we control or suppress or even uh, eliminate um, uh, that rate to, to, to zero. Um, after you've been infected for a while, from most diseases you you recover, um, and uh, and of course there is a risk that during the in, in the infectious um, stadium um, state you uh, you you get severely ill and, and to some extent you could also die. Um, that's possible to include as additional sort of. Um, compartments where you, you study basically the, the severity of, of, of the disease. Um, but in a, in a very simple uh, model, we only look at SIR uh, compartments. Um, when um, we talk about this type of uh, modeling frameworks and epi epidemiological frameworks, we talk about as, as states and a state space. Um, and the state space is the set of values that variables can take. Um, for example, it's the number of infected persons at a, a certain time point t. I t is, 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 is the variable um, realization um, in, in, in the state space. Um, we know usually some um, past states, so we could actually use to some extent data um, to um, um, calibrate or even estimate parameters um, in, in, into this model that determine the flow between the, the different states. Um, we don't know the long-term outcome and that's, you know, like any um, model, um, we don't know whether uh, the parameters that we have would be very good to, to predict the future, but we, we assume, and uh, to some extent, we could also elaborate uh, to see whether they've been good in the past to predict and so on. So that's definitely one of, of um, uh, the reasons to, to use this type of model is to, is to, to investigate long-term outcomes. And it, I'll, I'll get into that a bit later on, but it could be basically by uh, uh, making a, a forecast, or it could be by uh, making scenarios which sort of investigate under certain assumptions, potential outcomes. Um, in these process-based models, the, the SIR models, they um, give you predictions of the states and the future states, just like um, um, whatever, uh, you know, statistical or epidemiological model that you've been using in, in the past. So in that sense, they're very similar, but they do uh, encompass something new and that's the relationship um, between susceptible in, uh, infected and recovered people and the potential immune people. So you, you could actually take advantage of um, that we know something about um, what it means to be recovered, that you could potentially become immune, depending on the disease. Uh, we could also incorporate knowledge about the infectious stage and so on. So 
um, goes a little bit beyond um, uh, our traditional way of, of working with with data in that sense that we build more um, we build a stronger mental model into into the study um, there are uh, obviously a lot of important um, uh, parameters I, I mentioned some before uh, the r not and the herd immunity I'm going to go back to them those um, later on in 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 my talk um, in this box here we see in 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 a very simple way the mathematical expression for uh, this sir model it's um, if you're not used to mathematics it's not something you absolutely need to look into but it's you don't have to be scared at least because it's not very difficult it's just um saying basically that the flow out over time from susceptibles is a function uh, of the number of um, susceptible to the whole population meaning that the number of you know um, uh, um, susceptible to incorporating the number of immune of course and the number of infected people at a certain time so you you um, um, uh, basically as describe a flow out of of the s compartment and then the same rate that goes out of s the same number of people the same number of people actually go into infected so this is basically where it happens this is where uh, where we could describe uh, how many people become infected at a certain time uh, so that's obviously an important uh, parameter and into i we have the number of infected, but we subtract at that certain this, the time, the state, um, and time point. We actually subtract the people who who get back better, who recover, um, and that's um, and that's controlled by a, um, a recovery rate. Um, and those who get better, they end up in the recovered compartment. So this is a very simple expression. The N, N is uh, the, the whole population, and, and this is assuming there's no mortalities or births and so on. So it's a it's simplified case. So um, there is no magic with these type of models. It's just uh, it's just a very simple uh, dynamic representation of um, who who in the population gets sick and who recover. Um, we call um, um, we call the number of people um, uh, or getting sick in 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 this part here. Uh, there is an important uh, uh, part if we exclude s and just look at the beta i divided by m. That's what we call the the force of infection, and that's um, an important concept because it's it's the per capita. Uh, rate of, of uh, infections that infections ha ha happen. Um, I think I said before that the recovery rate um, is uh, is also uh, uh, this gamma uh, uh, parameter, um, and the beta parameter itself is called uh, the transmission rate. So this um, this is as, as complicated as it, as it is, and if if you if you sort of look into these uh, things, uh, you'll understand and understand the concepts. You'll understand most of these type of models, although they could, they come in millions of different forms and um, and complexity. Some could be very large, some could be very small, like this one. Um, but but this, the the idea behind the models is is basically the same. Um, Uh, okay, and then an important part in, in these models is this parameter B, the transmission rate, which govern um, how, you, how fast you go from being susceptible to uh, infected. And this parameter um, is, um, is, is, is a factor for COVID. It's, um, it's something we can think about as, uh, as a made up of, of, of part of uh, the contact rate of people, how often you meet people who could affect you, or how often you, 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 you stay close to people who could sort of, you know, um, 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 spill their droplets on you or uh, aerosols. And, um, and it's also um, 
to some extent the transmissibility. So beta is basically transmissibility times um, the contact rate. Um, um, so it's it's a it's a quite um, simple parameter to 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 understand, and it's possible to measure, of course, contact rates, and it's it's uh, to some extent also possible to understand what what transmissibility is. So in with the new variants, for example, there's a, a change in in this um, transmissibility, which makes the rate between susceptible and infected um, increase. Um, the, the rate of, of people and the force of infection. Um, this beta is, is uh, sometimes assumed constant in, in simple models, but it's often not, of course. It's, uh, it's um, something that's uh, uh, depending on, on a lot of other factors, probably, um, for example, um, contact rates could differ between different um, groups in, in the society, some people, individuals or um, socioeconomic groups could depend on your occupation or um, uh, whether you, for example, could you know, stay home and work from home or whether you meet a lot of people in, in your uh, daily work. Transmissibility um, could also depend on, on uh, other factors. It could depend on for example, uh, environmental conditions, um, making um, you know aerosol formation uh, more uh, likely. I think we're going to to um, have lectures about that later on. So I'm not going to talk about that. I'm just saying that these parameters, the beta, the, the govern the rate between susceptible and infected, can be um, uh, sensitive and and time dependent. Um, and in fact, when we work on, in my um, normal work on, on climate-related uh, uh, infections, uh, those uh, parameters are, are usually governed by, by climate, um, partly at least climate parameters. Um, with COVID, it's more about um, a seasonality and maybe at another you know, micro scale, um, um, smaller sort of microclimatic features and so on. Okay, so back to the basic reproduction number. The basic reproduction number is, uh, is usually defined as uh, a number of secondary cases arising from, from one infected uh, primary case uh, or infection um, in a population that's totally susceptible. So the basic reproduction, the R not is something that um, it's a sort of uh, considered as a yeah, characteristic of, of a virus or disease. Um, it can change, obviously, if, if, if uh, there is a you know, evolution and, and new strains become more transmissible. Um, but otherwise, it's, um, it's, it's kind of a, a, a characteristic that, that describes the, um, the speed of uh, the growth of an outbreak in the beginning of the outbreak phase before um, there's uh, a lot of people becoming um, uh, immune and before um, perhaps there's a lot of other type of interventions and control um, uh, changing um, uh, the transmission, uh, transmission rate. Um, the advantage with this R value, otherwise, is, is um, that you would see, if you know the R value, you see the simultaneous effect of uh, control, for example. Um, if, you, if you could measure the R value, um, and it's possible to estimate usually, you would, um, you would see um, impact of, of interventions and control before you actually um, see it, for example, in, in, uh, in mortalities, because you, you, you have a, a, a latency in, in those events to occur. Um, in a standard SIR model, which uh, we're looking at uh, here, you have the R not value equal to uh, beta divided by um, uh, the recovery rate. So it basically means that the R naught value is, is the transmission rate 
times the infectious period. Um, and that's uh, a quite use and, uh, uh, useful concept to, to, to remember. So if you think about R0 values, it's basically transmission rate times the, the uh, reproductive rate uh, times the, the infectious period. Um, <clears throat> and those estimates could end up very high. Then it means uh, that you have something that grows really fast. Um, and um, usually airborne diseases uh, are having very high R values, it grows uh, very fast. And some other diseases have uh, definitely lower R not values. If you go below one, um, it's not going to, it, the epidemic is not going to increase, it's going to decrease uh, and die out. So usually, um, that's the threshold you want to hit with your control uh, measures. Um, we talk about R values uh, also um, after the initial phase of an outbreak, and um, then it's usually RE or RT. RE means basically the you know effective um, reproductive rate and RT. Uh, just to the reproductive rate at, at a certain time. So those could be influenced by uh, interventions, control measures, and uh, to some extent that uh, a larger proportion of the population becomes um, immune and, and is sort of resistant uh, uh, to infection. Um, there is something uh, which uh, I, I guess most of you have also been um, exposed to now is, is herd immunity. At least in Sweden, it's been um, highly uh, uh, discussed. Um, herd immunity is achieved when uh, when a fraction of, of the population is, is immune, uh, and that fraction becomes so influential, so um, the transmission basically stops. Um, if there is a lot of transmission ongoing at the time you hit the level of of uh, the herd immunity level, you, you still have an overshoot, uh, of course, because you know you, it takes time for the epidemic to slow down. But if, if there's an introduction in a population which has hit herd immunity, it, it shouldn't take off. That's because the R, um, the R value, um, the, the re reproductive rate is, is basically not uh, uh, higher than one. So it, uh, any, outbreak even if even if they would occur it would die out quite fast um, most of those models i should mention i don't have time to go into every nitty-gritty detail but most of those models assume things of course and an important assumption here with the sir model and uh, and the beta is that you you have the contact is that you have a homogeneous mixing it means that like um, it's it's equally possible to meet anyone within that population um, that you study. In 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 reality, we know that that's not really true because you usually have mixing occurring in certain uh, situations, occupation occupational groups, or social um, spatial structures, and so on. Um, likewise, for COVID. Um, an important factor uh, seemed to be um, that um, there, there's a, a sort of an inhomogeneous um, R distribution. It's not so nicely, you know, uh, distributed. It has a, a, a heavy skewed tail, uh, meaning that some individuals would have really large um, uh, reproductive rates, and some individuals would have much smaller. Uh, and that's the super spreading. Um, maybe even um, uh, most individuals would have a really small um, uh, reproductive num uh, number, and, and and some individuals uh, would would uh, spread the disease to to large clusters. Um, another thing that's important and sort of an addition. Um, to uh, the, the standard SIR model, um, which is uh, 
used with with COVID uh, and and a lot of other applications is is the extension of the SIR model to the SEIR model. Um, that basically means that you have um, a, in addition uh, and sort of exposed compartment where you've um, where you've uh, in in that sort of state space during your um, latent phase uh, you've been uh, uh, exposed to to the virus you're developing uh, infectiousness but you haven't yet developed the infectiousness um, so that period would be somewhere you know three to four days probably that like you've you've uh, you you can't infect others but but you you're um, developing your infectiousness and then you move over to 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 being uh, infectious the pre-symptomatic uh, uh, phase is 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 not in in this uh, compartment because uh, in the pre-symptomatic phase you're still still uh, infectious so that's not much of uh, a large uh, change to the model it's just adding a compartment um, we have the rate of um, the, the time you uh, it takes to develop um, infectiousness after you've been exposed is basically determining who, how long you stay in this state and uh, in say it's three days then it's this rate is one over three um, Okay, so something about uh, uh, forecast and, and uh, scenarios. Um, these models are actually used, these type of models, I would say, um, with more or less um, data um, inputs are used uh, for um, both forecasts, for predicting um, disease and, and for scenarios. I've used them myself mostly for for scenarios where you could look at um, uh, you know under certain assumptions you can look at a type of what happens if we do this what happens if we do that what happens for example if we vaccinate this population in a certain according to to a certain scheme or what happens if we um, uh, uh, enforce uh, a certain, you know, uh, reduction in, in contact among certain groups in the population. Um, uh, and or also what happens if, if the a new strain with a certain transmissibility is uh, suddenly introduced and, and takes over what, what how, how large uh, demands uh, would we expect in healthcare given that we stay on the same uh, contact or mobility level as, as currently. Um, I, I should say there that the, there's a, a lot of um, this scenario and, and, and some even forecast um, uh, models uh, out there. One of them is this IHME um, um, dashboard, which is shown here. This is just a scenario or some scenarios of Sweden that they made in, I think, the beginning of December. Um, uh, I haven't checked, you know, these scenarios, and I, 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 but it basically shows um, uh, kind of a suppression scenario, uh, a scenario where little is done and uh, a scenario which is sort of more according to where where uh, mobility was at, at that moment. This model actually includes uh, mobility um, and a, a lot of data and it actually changes a little bit. If you look at it repeatedly, you'll see that it's not going to show, it's not going to show exactly the same thing. So uh, quite a lot of data going into these models. Um, um, if, if um, yeah, and and uh, and th these could also be used to look at like what happens if we don't do anything uh, as a sort of counterfactual uh, model scenario as well. Um, Depending on how you develop uh, immunity and, uh, and 
we know a little bit more about that now. Uh, we could use different models. I, I see I should probably not talk so much longer, but let you ask questions. I just want to mention um, that there's alternations to these models. Um, if you want to include, uh, for example, that you can get infected and then become susceptible again and not immune or recovered. Or if you go to uh, in the phase where you are recovered, but then it's waning immunity, so you go back to becoming infected. There's a, a simple uh, modifications to to the model framework which would actually capture that. Let's hope that's not going to be um, so much needed in terms of COVID. Um, yeah, but even with this very simple SEIR model. One could uh, do uh, interesting studies. We did uh, in like the simplest of all models. We've we've estimated, for example, the R not value associated with the outbreak in uh, on this Diamond Princess cruise ship in in um, somewhere in February last year, um, and it was actually. Uh, very high initially. It's confirmed that we just was one um, passenger with uh, with virus introduced in around 21st of January and so, and um, and and it, the, the outbreak just grow explosively, um, and, and it's it's quite interesting actually because when we were uh, had this paper under review in February, so. Um, the editor actually said like, oh, this can't have, you know, this can't be true. There must be something wrong with this because uh, it's only um, airborne or diseases that have these high R values. And maybe there is something to uh, that um, intuitive um, um, feeling of, of the editor. Anyway, I don't think I'll have much time uh, to discuss it. Here's here's the actual situation on the boat, and here's the counterfactual scenarios. There was strong uh, quarantine restrictions on on the boat quite early on, so they probably avoided a lot of uh, infections. But still, the the number of the um, the infection fatality rate here at that time I think was 1.6 percent, uh, a little bit older population, so a little bit higher therefore. Um, here's uh, just a graphic showing um, that these type of models can also be used for vaccination, understanding vaccination strategies. We pre-printed a study the other weekend uh, looking at age prioritizations. I, I heard that there was up uh, in the discussion before, so I thought I should add this. And, and also uh, what happens if we don't give vaccine to people with potential you know, uh, antibodies and um, and what happens if we vaccinate fast or slow and so um, I think that's it. Um, I'm, I'm going to stop sharing now because I don't have time to speak more, I think. So if there's any questions, um, comments or anything, uh, feel free. Um, something you didn't understand, probably difficult part of it. I bet. That was very good, Joachim, for as an introduction. Thanks a lot. Uh, could you comment a bit on the different estimates for herd immunity? You know, we, we started the epidemic with uh, saying 70% and everybody said it and everybody repeated it. Nobody knew exactly, you know, how it was calculated. And then later, this percentage went up in some, some of the estimates of virologists. Could you comment on how, um, how solid are these estimates? It's a good question. I, and we could talk about it for a long time, I think. <laughs> but yeah, no. Um, I mean, in if if everyone is uh, homogeneously mixed and all these, you know, um, um, if 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 those assumptions hold, then the R not value would actually give you the herd immunity level directly. Um, and early on in in the epidemic, um, the the R not value was estimated somewhere between two and three, and sometimes a little bit higher. Um, and if the, that would give you the herd um, uh, immunity threshold as one minus one divided by R naught. So it's a, it's a simple calculation. The higher R naught means 
uh, a higher um, uh, the number of people, percentage of people in the population need to be, to be immune in order to, for um, the transmission to, to basically the R value to drop below one. Um, so um, with two or three or say three, then it's, a, it's almost, it's around 70%. So um, now with the transmissibility increase, it went up. So transmissibility um, uh, around 60, 70% higher with the, with the, you know, the uh, B117 um, means you actually need to go a, a quite a bit higher in terms of herd immunity uh, to, to reach that uh, level where the R0 drops. Um, that's that's put simple, but then there is um, other aspects of the transmission. Uh, for example, there is a lot of stochasticity, and um, you know these type of super spreading occurring, and um, so that probably means um, you did you sometimes reach your super high uh, or not value and sometimes maybe not so that's that's ma it's making it a little bit more difficult to understand uh, exactly how high you need to aim in order to to really get um, uh, rid of the outbreaks on the other hand the stochasticity in these type of super spreading events and so on is also slowing transmission down a little bit so it could also be something that helps us a bit. Uh, there has been studies um, suggesting that the threshold could be a little bit lower. Um, um, but yeah, but it's, you know, to be on the safe side, you probably need to, nowadays you probably need to go up to 80 plus or so to really um, okay. make sure um, you, you curb uh, future outputs. There are two comments, one on the uh, what programs you use and whether the scripts are available and the other about the use of SEIHR models. Yeah. Um, so the um, program, we, I mean, it's not only me <laughs> in my group. We use various, we use R and we use MATLAB mostly. Um, um, so MATLAB, in MATLAB, the models are built from scratch, um, every single line. Um, in R, we sometimes use um, uh, some of these packages, which are, there's lots of packages for these type of SIR models in, in R, um, which are good, uh, of course. Um, and, and there's also lots of courses. If you really want to learn how to use these type of models, it's good to take courses. Um, in, in terms of what's relevant for environment, I, I, these time dependent uh, um, factors affecting your transmission rate or your contact rates, and those are not always uh, teach so much on, but, uh, um, but the other part, it's, it's pretty straightforward. Uh, the other qu question was on the limitations of this SIR models. Yeah, and one limitation is is that you um, assume um, uh, that you have this um, homogeneous, like equal mixing among the population, um, and there's um, that's uh, um, sometimes quite an unrealistic uh, assumption if you have you know spatial, echo, you know, so socioeconomic structuring of how population move or who meets who. Um, so there's um, ways to incorporate networks in the model. So you could basically have family networks or you could have uh, occupational networks and, and you could connect those um, or locations. Um, you could have neighborhoods or cities and so on, which sort of develops that a bit, uh, but still use the same framework. Um, it's quite a lot of interesting studies actually, um, uh, looking at restaurants, the uh, spreading and the role of restaurants and gyms and uh, different places in society um, for, for driving the epidemic. And those have 
actually use this, uh, some of those at least have used this framework, but on the network. Um, and then there is alternatives uh, to using this modeling framework overall. And you could use, for example, agent-based model where you look at individuals in networks and so on. I think if you want to move beyond, you probably want to look at, at networks to some extent to, to investigate them. Um, in homogeneity, or you could you could use some type of branching process model in order to capture um, the inhomogeneity in in the R values. We've talked about before the super spreading is basically uh, making the distribution of R values of individuals heavily skewed. That's probably why. Um, one has seen uh, quite a large impact from uh, restrictions in gatherings, in, you know, in, in gatherings of people in public spaces, and probably maybe connected to this uh, uh, potential aerosol um, uh, pathway of transmission. So, but, but basically, um, if you have um, an immune homogeneous spread and uh, a skew in, in the individual R number, reproductive number, um, and you truncate that distribution by restriction, you actually affect the mean, the average R value of the whole population much more because these uh, high values, the skew has a large influence on, on the population average. Um, and, and you, you get a, a quite big impact from, from restrictions of these type of events. It's probably likely um, that there are such things going on with, with COVID. Joachim, if you could take the last two chat comments and then we'll move to the next lecture. Can you open your chat? There's one yeah. on the use of hospitalized, isolated as a part of the model and the other on the bidirectionality uh, from uh, SIS, say. Yeah, um, the hospitalized. Uh, yeah, no, absolutely. It's 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 definitely worthwhile to incorporate uh, more compartments um, in in the study if you want to study, um, for example, healthcare demands or healthcare um, stress from from different scenarios, for example, or forecast healthcare stress. You definitely want to have. Um, uh, extend the model with with um, compartments for for the different states within the health, like um, critical care and, and hospital care and so on, and isolation. Um, so definitely, and and that's there's many possibilities to do that. You probably also want to have age um, in in the models, and that would also be something that you could develop and 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 look into in within this framework. Um, so yes to that. Um, uh, so, so you know, even if we, yeah, and um, I mentioned that quickly in the in the end that there is other type of model structures where you don't um, necessarily stay in the recovered or in the immune state for maybe there is no in, immune state at all. Then you go directly after infected. And you know, when you should have recovered, you go back to being susceptible and you can be infected again. Some diseases that would be a, a good model. Um, and then there's this SIRS model where you, you basically recovered for a while, but it's, uh, uh, it's not forever. And at some point we don't, I guess for COVID, we don't really know at this you know, moment, um, but it's possible that at some point we have waning immunity and will be susceptible again. The question then is whether we would be, um, you know, would be suffer a, a severe disease or not. And there's a lot of questions there, but those possibilities exist and it's not a very difficult change to the model structure to, to incorporate that. Thank you. So I think we'll finish here. That was just fantastic uh, talk. Thanks a lot and for everybody asking questions. And we move to the last presentation that uh, um, I will do. Um, and um, again, in this um, uh, session, 
uh, today we are talking um, about uh, more about COVID, not so much about environment, but it's basic so that in the next recessions we will go more into the environment. And I will talk about the global epidemiology of SARS-CoV-2 infection and COVID-19, and I will talk more from the public health point of view rather than a very uh, strict biomedical point of view. Um, so I will talk about the global evolution of the COVID-19 pandemic, the transmission, susceptibility and risk factors, social inequalities and vaccines. Um, and I'll do that in 25 minutes. Um, so this is how we started, how we started outside China. So in um, 2 February, we had the first death reported outside China in the Philippines. In uh, 14 February, the first uh, death in Europe, that's from France. Um, in 29 February, the first US death announced. And um, it goes on and on. Um, the World Health Organization recognized the pandemic on 11 of March. And at the end of September, we um, reach 1 million deaths globally around the end of September. And now we have nearly 3 million persons. So it's an amazingly quick evolution that we had never seen before. Um, it is so quick that um, um, if we look at the main cause of death, this is from the global burden of disease. It doesn't really matter that it is uh, 2016. This doesn't change uh, so much the cause of death, except for COVID, that now is the third uh, most common cause of death. Uh, in the world and is going up. Um, so a huge uh, issue. Um, it goes so quick and it changes um, and the geographic distribution is dynamic. If you look at actual cases, this is the um, a map of Europe in week 14 with uh, epicenter in Italy, Spain and some of Central European countries. That's week 26 of the year, where um, that was after the first wave in Europe. So that was controlled, but Sweden continued uh, with um, high rates. And that's week 42. Um, the second wave that was a complete disaster for Europe with uh, high rates everywhere. So. This is important to take also into account because a number of epidemiological studies are based on ecological comparisons. And um, so you would get very different results depending on whether you did the analysis here, week 26 on week 42. And um, we'll talk about it uh, a bit later. So this is a slide I had from a talk I had given in 12th of May. Uh, this is from the Johns Hopkins. 4 million cases, nearly 300,000 deaths. This is 3 October, 1 million deaths. That's uh, uh, when we uh, bypass the 1 million deaths limit. This is 27 January, 100 million cases. That's where we went up. And that's yesterday, 136 million cases, nearly 3 million deaths. I haven't checked today. So a huge... Uh, um, increase in a very, very uh, limited time period. Um, cases practically uh, everywhere. And um, I don't know what is this yellow line that appeared on my screen, but that's okay. Um, in all continents, well, apart from the Antarctica. Um, and actually differences in the number of reported cases by uh, areas. And we have, um, the situation in uh, Australia and Pacific, Australia and New Zealand, that is New Zealand more controlled. We have the situation in Africa that it's not easy to understand um, um, the situation in Africa. If you had done an, um, some kind of assumption before the epidemic, you would have assumed that we would have many more cases. Certainly the population of Africa is younger, so you don't get, uh, you may get cases, but not deaths. And perhaps, um, the, um, there is also an issue, obviously, of reporting. Um, there may be other issues that we don't understand. So this is the global situation. So rapid development of the pandemic globally, irrespective of the level of economic development. And it's a unique situation since uh, the Spanish flu 
It is a major cause of death and marked geographic differences in the distribution of the disease. And some of the patterns, particularly what happens in Sub-Saharan Africa are not easy to explain. We have the disease and then we have the secondary effects of the disease and of the measures to control the disease. A major issue in many countries is what happens with vaccinations, routine vaccinations. Uh, here at the bottom left, we see USA, uh, decrease of child vaccinations, dramatic decrease. Here on the right-hand side is a paper uh, on the effect of vaccinations in Africa. Uh, and I will put, um, um, comparing the prevention from the normal vaccinations that we have, diphtheria, tetanus, pertussis, hepatitis B, et cetera, et cetera, and the number of deaths in children in Africa at the time of uh, la, fall uh, uh, 2020. So at that time, we could expect that we have about 700,000 deaths in children in Africa prevented by vaccination. And at that time we had 8,000 deaths from COVID. And vaccinations for a number of the child diseases were very much affected. So the risk benefit ratio between normal vaccinations and COVID is about 84 if you just make the division of the two numbers which means that COVID is obviously a huge problem, but we cannot stop taking into account all the other um, interventions we have. And if we do that, as we actually, it actually happened in many countries, we will have an effect that is not COVID, but it is in a way a result of, um, of the pandemic and of the um, problems with uh, the, the way we have administered our health services and our preventive health services. Um, in many countries that have cancer screening programs, uh, these have been uh, very much affected. Uh, there are um, models in many countries on how the reduction um, in screening, here you can see in the US, uh, decreases in screening this um, in breast cancer, col colorectal cancer, and cervical cancer screening. And there are many models that show how um, this decrease in screening will result in higher uh, mortality. Some of it can be recovered, obviously, because these are slowly developing cancers, but there are uh, models that have been done in many countries showing how this type of effects on screening will affect, uh, in fact, mortality. So apart from the first three um, um, key points on the global distributions, we have to take into account that the effects of the pandemic and the response to the pandemic are long-term and wider than the morbidity directly due to the infection. And here, uh, a huge issue, I, re I refer to that in my first talk is the story of mental health, uh, which uh, appears to be a major issue in many countries. Um, so what are the factors affecting disease occurrence or um, severity? Um, as uh, Neil also mentioned, um, the most important factor is age. Here you can see, this is a study that uh, you have the paper in the material uh, in the UK. And um, this is, um, you can see the differences by age, huge effect of age. And you can also see the differences by sex. So much bigger effect of uh, males compared to females. So these are two major uh, factors. Um, this is the same study. You can see it in categories, the effect of age, the effect of sex. Obesity, apart from diabetes that was already mentioned, is a major uh, factor for the severity of the disease. And this actually uh, certainly affects severity, the descriptive epidemiology of COVID in many populations where we have a very um, high proportion of obese people. Smoking is not affected. This is an interesting discussion, but we, leave, we can leave it for, for um, later if you want of why smoking is not modifying the effect of COVID. And obviously the other extremely important factors are ethnicity and deprivation, social class. And these are interrelated and we have very consistent findings and I'll show some data on how uh, deprived populations have um, uh, much more severe disease. Um, this is a very nice study on um, elderly population um, in, um, um, oops, sorry, in the in the United States, where apart from the classical risk factors, age, sex, etc., they also evaluated. Um, physical functioning and cognitive functioning as factors. And they found that they were uh, people with a worse co cognitive functioning 
had much uh, worse uh, disease, much more severe disease. So why would that be? Well, there are several reasons, and that's important to know because then you can you can prevent better. So why would that be? Well, because um, uh, people who have a severe disability, serious problems with cognitive functioning, obviously they have other issues of nutrition, they get infections, but obviously they have much more intense contact with uh, personnel, um, um, people taking care of them. So much higher probability of becoming infected. So these are the, the probable explanations for that. So depending on the populations you study, you may have different factors affecting more or less. Um, one of the issues that have been discussed a lot um, is the um, um, air pollution. How does air pollution affect um, affect COVID. There has been uh, quite a heated discussion on that. The biggest studies we have until now are basically ecological studies. This is one of the most uh, well-known studies. You have the paper, um, the PDF of the paper in the Moodle, and uh, this was done in the United States. And basically what was done um, was done was a correlation of uh, long-term air pollution levels. This is PM 2.5 with, um, with uh, COVID-19 deaths. And the findings are amazing because uh, we're talking about an increase of one microgram per cubic meter. You know, that's not very much associated with a statistic significant 11% increase in risk in COVID-19 deaths. That's huge. Um, this study was criticized um, and there's a very interesting uh, uh, methodological article by Paul Villeneuve and Mark Goldberg at uh, EHP talking about the biases of ecological studies on air pollution and COVID, discussing um, how, um, for example, uh, COVID developed first in urban centers, you had more air pollution in urban centers. So it is not so much air pollution, but it's more uh, the fact that you develop the disease because of population density, contacts, etc. cetera. Um, we are now starting having studies on individual, um, with individual data and our own study actually uh, shows not so high risk, but shows high risk of air pollution based on individual data with a very uh, extensive control of confounding and uh, severity of the disease. Um, the problem with interior spaces, this is now in a way well understood, but it took some months to understand it. And we lost a lot of time where um, many of the efforts were focused on the droplets. So when we breathe, we have aerosols that remain suspended in the air for hours and we have droplets that in seconds fall down. And uh, for a long time, the efforts were cleaning our hands, cleaning the surfaces, cleaning everything. And um, the recommendations we gave or WHO gave or the other regulatory agencies gave were not so much on aerosols. And little by little, we understood how important are aerosols. So many of the protective um, measures we're taking, we go to the supermarkets, we have the cashiers with the plastic you know, shield there. And this is okay, it's good. But what that does is basically prevents the droplets. It doesn't prevent the aerosols. And there are lots of models that have been shown. I'm sure you have seen this or similar type of schemes where you have a room, uh, one infected, and uh, one, two, three, four, five other people in the same room. If they stay four hours, no masks, no ventilation, everybody will get infected. If they stay four hours uh, with masks, um, nearly, nearly everybody will get infected except for one because masks are great. But if you have a very high load um, and you stay a long time, in an environment, in a closed environment, you eventually get infected. And if you use masks and you have ventilation and you limit the time to two hours, then just one person gets infected. So this is now common knowledge and it's extremely important to take preventive action. And we have a talk on, on this by, uh, by Joe Allen, who has done extremely interesting work on, on this issue. This is something that uh, Joachim actually referred, uh, not to this, I'm sure he was referring probably to this study. Um, this is an analysis of mobility using um, phones, cell phones, 
um, from about 100 million persons in US cities and associating mobility with um, COVID-19 disease. And you can see how this is a really very, very interesting study and very nice application of the way we're using sensors, well, cell phones or whatever now in environmental epidemiology. And they could show very, very clearly about um, how um, um, full service restaurants, fitness centers, so closed areas where you had lots of people would be extremely important for the propagation of the disease. The other thing they showed is the importance of health inequities. So look at this graph for top income decile in okra and in purple bottom income decile. So, and you can see that the risks, the, the cumulative infections are much bigger in the bottom income decile. And this is a repeated findings again and again, and I'll come back to that. And what certainly we have to take into account is that these findings are for the US and it refers to the patterns in the US. Um, they probably can be applied in other countries, but um, other countries may have different social patterns. So let's see this, um, this situation here uh, from Africa uh, in a very, um, um, low, a uh, low income country, uh, poor conditions, you cannot afford to have K95 masks that you change. Uh, eventually, you don't have uh, water uh, uh, um, at your house necessarily to clean your hands. So what happens in the States is not necessarily transmissible directly to what happens in many other parts of the world. Um, and we have to, to evaluate the situations also locally to take measures. So the worldwide, worldwide, about two in 100 people are known to have coronavirus. In the United States, nine in 100. Um, but even within the United States, there are populations, say the prisoners, where um, infection rates are much higher. And we know that chances are not the same for everyone. This we knew before, and definitely it happens with COVID. And we have the huge issue of health inequities in COVID-19. Um, many of the um, uh, studies that have been um, done um, follow more or less the same approach as, um, as, as the ones for air pollution. They are based on uh, a comparison of uh, uh, ecological comparison of some kind of um, social vulnerability indices as this one with uh, incidence of disease or mortality. And um, they are very good. They have limitations, certainly. And, but they give very, very consistent results. This is from the US. You can see this is for a medium uh, size um, community. Um, and you can see estimated incidence, estimated mortality, the more privileged communities, middle privileged, less privileged communities. And you can see huge differences. And these are findings that come again and again and again. And we have a really serious problems in uh, practically all countries of the world with social inequities, possibility of infections and, um, and disease. Um, also, uh, what is important is that the measures we took for mobility affect the lives of the people differently. We put lockdowns, we um, people have lost their jobs. And this has not happened in the same way in all strata of society. This is again a study from the US. So individuals with low incomes have a higher odds of job loss. And this goes also with low middle income and also it goes with uh, ethnicity. Uh, people with low income would have a higher odds of food insufficiency they would have a higher odds of default for paying the rent or the mortgage. They would have um, a higher odd of inaccessibility of medical care. Although here the difference is actually in sort of structured societies, even in societies like the US where they don't have uh, national health systems as in Europe or as in other parts of the world, you know, these differences here are not as extreme as the, socioeconomic, the other socioeconomic differences. So let's move to vaccines. And I put the photos of the two most used vaccines, uh, Pfizer and AstraZeneca. Obviously, the main problem we have, but it's not the only problem we have with vaccines, is that we don't have enough vaccines. Um, 
I see this this um, picture from um, um, a worker in the health service in India. That um, that's an old picture pre-pandemic that writes to a village for a polio vaccine. And India is actually a country with a very structure, it's a very structure that has a huge pharmaceutical industry for vaccines. They are administering well other vaccines, but you know, just look at this picture. It's impossible in this situation to think that uh, the RNA vaccines that need deep freezers can be administered. So we have to use some of the other vaccines that are, could be administered in this uh, situation. And India, as I said, is a country that has a pretty good development you know, of distribution of vaccines. This is the situation in the world, vaccination rates. That is now, last week, 34 people in 100 in, the, in North America, 20 in 100 in Europe, 11 in 100 in South America, 7.3 in 100 in Asia, 2.7 in Oceania. But this is also a conscious decision in Oceania of not vaccinating in some of the countries and one per 100 in Africa. This is huge differences. So when we are talking about health inequities, there's no doubt that within countries we have really significant health inequities. But if we move from country, within country to the global perspective, the most important health inequities in COVID-19 at this point in time are those between rich and poor countries, particularly regarding vaccinations. These are the provisions for coverage of um, COVID vaccines. So we will have more or less at the end of the year, 78% of the populations in North America and Europe covered. And the expectation is that for some of the poorer countries in the world, we will cover vaccination, not this year, not next year, but in 2023. This is morally unacceptable and also for dangerous for public health. And I just want to quote Dr. Tedros, who at the uh, World Health Assembly in the 18th of January said more than 39 million doses, that was the 1st of January, now we are more than 700 million doses, but at that time, more than 39 million doses of vaccine have now been administered in at least 49 higher income countries. Just 25 doses have been given in one lowest income country, not 25 million, not 25,000, just 25. It is impossible to control COVID like that globally. Um, okay. Um, the issue with the with the vaccines um, are important to control the pandemic. See, so here we see three of the countries that had gone very quickly: Israel, UK, Chile but they're not necessarily enough. And you can see the confirmed cases in UK that have gone down, in Israel they have gone down, in Chile they start going down and then they have gone up. And the reason for that is that even with a 40% vaccination, you have 60% who are not vaccinated. And even those who are vaccinated, if they don't take care, you know, they have a period after the vaccination that they can still get infected. And so this is what happened in Chile. They vaccinated, it was a big success, and then they dropped all the other uh, prevention measures and they got another uh, epidemic. So vaccination is key, but during the interim period, it is not enough. Obviously we have the situation of the mutations and that is one of the issues that are um, extremely important to take care. If we vaccinate only part of the world and we don't vaccinate all the world, the issue is obviously moral, but it's also an issue of public health. You have active areas of the epidemic, so you will have more probabilities of getting mutations. So there are many reasons, both moral and public health, that we have to go much, much quicker through the COVAX system to uh, help vaccinate the whole world. This is a painting by uh, Jackson Pollock, uh, an abstract artist from the United States, Convergence, made in 1952. Just let's keep two or three seconds. Look at this painting.
So I'm sorry to tell to those of you who try to find um, some patterns here or some associations of pattern that that's what the anti-vaxxers are doing. In fact, this was a painting that was shown in a study that you have the, the PDF in the Moodle where they uh, evaluated um, a number of images in uh, people who are pro-conspiracy theory, anti-vaxxers and others. And the anti-vaxxers to a largest extent found associations in this chaotic uh, painting that has no schemes, no evident pattern. A girl gets the papillomavirus vaccine. Two days later, she drowns in a lake. This is a real example, I'm saying. And the anti-vaxxers say this was due to the papillomavirus vaccine. No association in reality. This is the issue. Uh, in 2019 and 2019, WHO actually, that was pre-pandemic, pre-COVID pandemic, um, identified the 10 ma major risks to global health and had vaccine he hesitancy. That was the time of the measles epidemic, 2018, 2019. And while we know that vaccines are one of the most effective ways to prevent disease, they prevent two to three million deaths a year and another 1.5 could be prevented if we had a better global vaccination. But still we have a big and important movement against the vaccines, poison, you know, pandemic hoax. Uh, so why does this happen? And how, how, what can we do about it? Um, this is a study that my colleague Jeff Lazarus did um, last year with the international team. Uh, they were asked in several countries, if a COVID-19 vaccine is proven safe and effective and is available, I will take it. And you can see that for some countries, the percentage was high, but look at countries like Nigeria, France, Poland, Russia, 60 to 50%. That's very low. Things changed by the end of the year as the vaccines came and the percentage increased in Sweden, UK and Finland. But now with the a very, very uh, problematic policies that have been followed, especially with the AstraZeneca vaccine, we again, we have a, a new increase in hesitancy. And this is very dangerous. This is a really nice study. This was done again before the pandemic. That refers to the story of the measles um, epidemic uh, before the COVID pandemic, where they analyzed about 100 million individuals out of the 3 billion users of Facebook, 100 million individuals who had done a comment in Facebook on, um, on the vaccines. And you can see on the bottom right that the anti-vaxxers anti are not so many, 4.2 million out of the 100 million. The pro, people who did pro-vaccine were 7 million and the undecided people who didn't do any comment was uh, the majority, 74 million. But look here how the contacts of the anti-vaxxers increase while the contacts of the pro-vaxxers do not increase. And look at the distribution. The pro-vaxxers are located in a very specific cluster. We, we are talking to us, those of us in the course. We are talking to people like us. The anti-vaxxers are located with their context there where most people are. So they are much more connected with the big part of people using Facebook. How do we administer this? We are not even trained to deal with this. Um, so this is a huge issue of how we can deal with communications that um, are outside our normal communication routes. So what are the lessons learned from um, um, the COVID-19? We're getting every day more lessons. First of all, as I mentioned also in the first lecture, a pandemic was expected, not this pandemic, but a pandemic could have been expected. We have a ser serious a stress test for our health systems. And we've talked already about surveillance, Neil talked about it, and about the need to promote public health approaches. We have learned that airborne transmission is crucial and how important are the use of masks. We have learned how quickly we can develop scientific knowledge and how quickly science can, uh, can go to help prevent the disease. Um, we know that global vaccine coverage is crucial for more reasons and for security. And we know that early and aggressive public health policies are successful. And we can uh, add more lessons, learn if you want. I'll finish with this photo. 
This is a photo from the third wave of the Spanish flu, a hundred years ago. Activists in the United States promoting the wearing of masks at a time when people were relaxed and then the third wave came. And you can see wear a mask or go to jail. We don't put people to jail, but we put fines to them. But it just stresses the need to continue uh, all our efforts to prevent the disease um, uh, until we manage to get into a different situation with COVID. Uh, viruses are not political. It's our response to them that is political. And we really have to become very active, all of us in public health and environmental health to help uh, prevent the disease. So I'll finish here. So let's see the comments from the chat. Um, uh, I don't know, Catherine, if you have gone through the. Yes, we've um, some of them have been in have been uh, answered as we go. Uh, Neil's oh. been chiming in there, um, but there were some there was a discussion about the role of temperature and climate and um, we will cover that extensively in the third session, um, but uh, uh, Neil's also chimed in that the role is is shown to be quite small in comparison to uh, control strategies, and um, basically the risks associated with uh, with vaccines. That um, you know this issue of it being not necessarily been risk risk free, but considering the risk trade offs, um, and just to point out, we have just. A you know, uh, a, a few more minutes, but um, for discussion. But uh, if you want to comment on any of those, yeah, sure. There's a comment of who are the 25 people who got the vaccine in the first low-income country? They were members of the government. They were the leading. You know, it was not the the, the population. Unfortunately, in that case, um, it doesn't really matter which country it was. Uh, we have had uh, many situations where vaccines at the, at the first phase were not distributed equally. Um, I think this, uh, and, and there were a huge crises, for example, in Peru, for example, and in other countries. I think this is gradually being solved in most countries and, and as vaccines become more available and as COVAX administers more, many more vaccines, this will be less of a problem, but it is really a, an issue of... Uh, um, in many places of the world, um, how vaccines will become available. Um, in um, And it's not only how they will become available, is who will take them, you know, how, how much we will reach people and how much the message that you have to get vaccinated reaches people, which is, again, there are issues of inequality going there. Um, so... You get the vaccine, first dose, second dose, still develop COVID. There are cases of people who had taken COVID vaccines, but who got disease and even died. What are your thoughts about that? We are getting more data on that. Um, you can, uh, th there are many cases where you got the first dose um, and we have good statistics from the UK and from Israel and from other uh, countries on that, where you get the first dose, you stop taking measures, you haven't developed yet your uh, um, immunity uh, antibodies have, haven't gone up and then you get infected because you are not yet immune. The fact that you get the vaccine doesn't mean you get immune immediately. You have to wait some time. Mm -hmm. uh, so this is a clear issue. But then the other issue is the issue of the mutant or the mutations. And there we start having uh, data from um, Israel, for example, um, which is uh, some of them are are maybe preoccupying for some of the mutants that are not well covered from the from the vaccine. And we had also data from South Africa, in fact, for the South African variant. So if if uh, at, at, at present, the mutation that is, has become more common in many countries is the British one. And although it, it helps transmit the disease, it seems to be very well controlled from the existing vaccines in terms of severity of the symptoms, which is what you want to prevent in reality. Now, if we start getting the the South African uh, mutation as the most common mutation or the one from uh, Manaus, uh, Japan, um, then that might be a problem. And that would mean we will have to get a, an, another dose of the vaccine, in fact, another vaccine that would cover these mutations. 
If I could just add one thing, Manolis, in support yeah. of what you said about the role of social deprivation. Um, we have data in the UK, which we haven't published yet, but we know that healthcare workers are now quite well protected, but people like bus drivers, taxi drivers, people who have contact with the public have three or four times the risk of death from COVID. And I've spent a lot of time saying it's an occupational disease, but you know maybe we should, we should try adjusting for social deprivation. And we've found if you adjust for geography, ethnicity deprivation, the occupational effects almost completely go away. They yeah. go from three or four times down to 1.5 times. And it may well be that if you're in a low paying job, you're living in bad housing, it's overcrowded, um, you've, maybe you've got teenage children who are going out and socializing, um, it may be safer at work, even if work uh, risks as well. So it's an unusual occupation. It's often the home conditions are more important than the working conditions. Absolutely. Yeah. How to trust, uh, how long does it take to develop full immunity after the vaccination? In fact, um, you get pretty good immunity with the first dose for most of the vaccines. The, the boost is to enhance the immunity at the long term, in fact, but um, you get, uh, you know, after uh, two, three weeks, you have a pretty, uh, you, you have developed, uh, you know, uh, quite a lot of the immunity you would get also with the boosting. So um, if you get vaccinated, you know, keep very, very, you know, a lot of protection the first weeks, mm -hmm. and then you probably are, are um, immune, but you will have to do the boosting to, to keep it for uh, long term. How to trust the effectiveness of certain vaccine brands, especially in low mid private sector is also selling vaccines. People are hesitant to get vaccinated, not because they don't rely on vaccination phenomena, rather they don't know which brand to trust. Um, really, the story with AstraZeneca uh, in many countries have been um, terrible, terrible to, to um, here in Spain, the regulatory, the, the, the Ministry of Health, you know, three weeks ago said, everybody below 55 should be vaccinated with AstraZeneca. You know, two weeks later, everybody above 60 to 65, and then one week later from 60 to 69. So this is not the way to go. You know, you re I understand that there is a lot of hesitancy if you don't give a clear message. Also, it is true that we are getting a lot of new knowledge. So some of these decisions are wrong, a posteriori, we didn't know they were wrong, but you know, we definitely could have handled the story of AstraZeneca, and AstraZeneca, in fact, could have handled the story much, much better. The story of the private um, um, uh, availability of the vaccines is very, very complex, frankly speaking. So that is why um, both in um, um, many countries uh, and also the COVAX, the COVAX scheme um, is not, uh, you know, will just give the vaccines to the public uh, sector, not to the private sector. Now, it is uncontrollable in some countries. In some countries you go and you get the private uh, vaccination, but these are minority countries, uh, fortunately, um, I think uh, at present. So I think we will have to stop Catherine, unfortunately. Um, yes, so um, just before we close the session, I want to um, give Ariana the opportunity just to make some clarifications about how to access the Moodle and uh, the Zoom link for the next sessions. Ariana? Yes, thank you, Catherine. So we are sending you the emails uh, again to access Moodle, but if you don't receive it um, after today, please send me an email and, and I'll try to help you. Um, and well, now Catherine will mention that, but for the ones who don't have access yet, like the test will be open a bit longer. Um, so yes, but we recommend it to do it um, as soon as possible then. Thank you, yeah. And yeah, sorry, for the, for the next session, you can use the same Zoom link as today. That's it, yeah, thank Great. you, Kat. Thank you. Um, so uh, thank you for your patience. We work out a few of these uh, sort of niggling technical issues, but um, the uh, hopefully you can find your way to the Moodle and the, the learning activity there um, either today or as you know, we'll keep it open and we'll see you back here on Thursday. So thanks very much to our speakers and, um, and thanks very much for the lively discussion and uh, see you on Thursday.